Well, hello and good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live from news about Desawe Kanda. Also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279. All across the world on 3news.com. I'm Alfred Akansi. Tonight, after more than two months of back and forth, uh, the Colleges of Education Teachers Association of Ghana, CTAC, and government have failed to resolve their differences for CTAC members to return to the classroom, leaving students to their own. CTAC is now accusing government of twisting the story about this strike. Stay with us. We have a conversation tonight. Also, the National Democratic Congress's campaign promise of no academic fees for level 100 public university students is generating a lot of reaction and scrutiny as a flag bearer, John Dramani Mahama, gives further and better particulars and some more details. Stay with us. We have the president of the University Teacher Association of Ghana, UTAG, joining us tonight. Also, is increasing number of inexplicable killings in some parts of the North Ghana, sparking security concerns and fear amongst residents. We'll tell you exactly what the situation is right there, here on Ghana tonight. And we have eyes on this issue of uh, Galamse in the Konongo area and the situation is not looking good. The EPA and then also all the other authorities have been talking about it. But then again, what's the situation? Stay with us. You're an integral part of the show. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana tonight on Facebook and on X. Let's get talking. Let's settle for Ghana, please. The Electoral Commission has dismissed claims that its failure to release the Provisional Voters Register is unlawful. According to the National Democratic Congress, the EC has failed to obey its own electoral calendar despite earlier assurances to provide the register to the parties in time. Director of Training at the EC, Dr. Seribor Kweku, has been reacting to the NDC's concerns. The law says that when we finish, we have about 30 days to come back, so we are within the law. We, will make them. Don't, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't lose out of fact that when did we finish the uh, 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 more Papua. When did we finish? It was just you know, on Saturday. And are they ready for the, uh, the figures without the more Papua? In that case, not, it is not a register. See, the issue is that me sitting here, I, will, I always believe in accuracy. I will not rush and say that I'll give the figures to them. When they are errors, they themselves will come back and ask. Residents of Konongo are getting alarmed over the growing activities of illegal miners in the area. They are questioning government's commitment in ending the menace, saying despite the resources pumped in the war against Galamse, the illegal activities keep expanding. First thing I want to inquire, is there even a war against illegal mines? There is no war. You've been hearing on the news that there is a war. I'm telling you there is no war because when you come to where they are mining, those in authority are those involved. There is no war against illegal mining. Now I have to think of putting charcoal in to make my water clearer. The Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Samo Abujinapo, has more kicked against politicization of the fight against illegal mining. He has also been reacting to the allegations of government appointees acquiring state land. Some allegations have been put out, specific allegations. And those allegations were put out on the basis that these are evidence of state capture, that the government of President Akufuado was engaged in state capture. And I said to you that for me, when th those allegations are made, my first port of call is the Lands Commission. And my first request is that I want the facts, I want the data. The data has been assembled, the facts have been put out. It turns out that it's not Akufo the government that sold those lands. The lands were sold in 2015 and 2016.
The Public Accounts Committee has recommended the prosecution of management of the Ghana School of Law over procurement breaches. The Auditor General's report flagged the procurement of goods and services to the tune of 327,000 CDs using single source without prior approval from the Board of the Public Procurement Authority. The violation or the infraction came about probably because of inadvertence. As I said, um, other people were charged. But then uh, we will urge that we should be forgiven. And then if we do, if you repeat, then you may then crack the whip. There's a body that is a court that might determine, the judges will determine that, oh, the plea you are giving will forgive you. So what we can do is to refer you to the court, that the court will set you free because we don't have that power to do it. Several centuries ago, Ghana's colonial masses left the shores of the country, leaving behind cultures which have since defined different sectors of our society. Whereas some have been beneficial, others have arguably outlived their usefulness. One of such practices is the long legal vacation observed by the superior courts. Some lawyers, however, maintain it's a necessary evil. Judges also take the opportunity to write their judgments and rulings. And so it's not like we're on vacation. So we are not working. I'm, I, look, I'm, I'm here today, of course. I'll say, I'll say I'm in Mufti. But I, I've come to do some work. For me, it's, it, I mean, it's not too long. I, I even wish it could be longer. Well, I, I think uh, it's, it's necessary uh, because uh, as lawyers, most of the time you realize that the whole year you are engaged in legal work. By the time you get to this period, you, you start experiencing the fatigue and all that. So I think it's, it's in one way it's important because it gives us the opportunity to take a break from work. This morning is on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook and on DSTV channel 279 all across the world on 3news.com. I'll show you the QR code that you can also connect with us and share the stream as we go on here on Ghana Tonight. But coming up next, the fear and panic in some parts of the northern Ghana over what many describe as strange killings. The numbers keep swelling, raising security concerns what exactly is going on and and what's really instigating this mysterious murders essentially across some parts of the country let's get into it there's just growing concern amongst residents of uh, tuna tuna is in the solar tuna kalba district of the savannah region over alleged serial killings and the the latest being a, a young lady who is suspected to have been murdered. Now, what you're seeing on the video is the, the area the, where this young lady, the deceased, lived. The body of the lady who is or was a hairdresser apprentice was discovered around a fuel station at Tuna. The lady believed to be in her early 20s is said to have complained of stomach upset at work and excused herself to go and eat attend to nature's call. Uh, however, that's in the bush. And however, her dead body, we understand, was later discovered around the fuel station. It is indeed unclear how she she died, but residents suspect that this is another case of this mysterious killings has been happening in, in their area, you know, especially considering the circumstances under which the body was found and would we'll, we'll establish whether you know, cases of some body parts missing as has been consistent with these previous mysterious killings but that what you're seeing on the video that on the screen right now are videos of these residents who got it at the location where this lady's body was found unfortunate situation there let's establish a few things christopher Marcon is our nothing as an original correspondent we're going to be joined by the Honorable Rashid Pelpo shortly as well to have a conversation on this because all of this, if you recall, he's been at the forefront of it because his constituency also has recorded a number of these mysterious killings. And Christopher, I appreciate your time. Good evening. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First of all, the, the, the lady 
whose body was discovered at this fuel station after she had told persons that she was going to attend to nature's call in the bush. Was there any body parts missing when she was found, when the body was found? So our friend, with, with this one, there wasn't any parts missing, in fact, not even a cut on uh, the lady, but we have had instances where uh, some deaths were reported, especially in the Mole area, uh, with, with some parts missing and um, uh, which raised some concerns amongst the uh, residents. I see. And you've been talking to these residents. Exactly what have they been telling you about the circumstances leading to the death of suspected murder of this young lady? Yes, so uh, Alfred, like you rightly mentioned, the lady uh, was at work and by midday she informed her uh, colleagues and her master uh, that she was going to attend to nature's call and unfortunately she did not return and so uh, they got worried and started looking for her uh, only to find her uh, around a fuel station where there is also a dam uh, in the area and the residents have been raising some concerns because um, uh, not too long ago uh, on the 19th of July a similar incident happened where uh, a middle-aged man was found dead outside and so uh, this this has become a matter of concern within a space of three months uh, some three persons have allegedly are, are being killed uh, as a result of uh, this uh, perceived to be some issues of uh, ritual killings in uh, the area. And so people are worried. And uh, after, if you go to uh, Bole, you go to Sola, uh, and probably in the one municipality, I can talk about Bole and Sola. This time, if you are in Sola, you will not see people moving around. Uh, you see everybody uh, indoors. If you go to uh, Bola, it's the same thing. People are afraid to move at night. Uh, stay with me a bit because um, let me also welcome the Honorable Rashid Pelpo, who is a member of parliament for the uh, Wa Central constituency. I appreciate your time, uh, Lord Rashid Pelpo. So, so these mysterious killings are now, from what we're hearing, spreading beyond your constituency. And I say your constituency because the Wa municipal area or that constituency had been experiencing these these mysterious killings over the last couple of years now and then we're hearing that Bole Sola have also recorded some of these uh, mysterious killings concerning is it not well uh, let me tell you it's heartbreaking it's troubling and uh, we are very anxious about what is happening we are determined to find out exactly what the situation is all about. So it's a situation of worry and concern that individuals or a person can go out there, kill other people consistently. Only they said they have gotten up to 20. In while we record one again, um, a few days ago, a madman was slaughtered and hidden, kept away somewhere, and, um, you know, was discovered quite recently and had been killed like three days, two days uh, before he was found. And this about the six days since then. So it, it's a serious concern. And I can tell you, uh, my people are worried. I'm worried too. I cannot understand how a security arrangement can foister in this situation where the lives of people are in danger uh, people are killed especially those who are uh, very vulnerable they go to uh, security uh, security men who are keeping uh, organizations secured when they sleep they go to hit, hit them and then take parts of their bodies away so i think that investigations must be much more than we are seeing. And, and it's a very serious matter of concern. And, and, and let me establish this. How many persons have been mysteriously killed in your constituency? Well, I, I, in the last count, we, we, we recorded about 16. 
And uh, with, a, with a recent, very recent, less than a week ago, death of this madman, um, it would have taken the number to 17. You know, these mad guys were getting vanished, and we didn't know, we didn't know what was happening until we started discovering their bodies hidden, you know, in shallow graves and the others. And then when they don't find the madmen, they go for the security men who are lying alone at uh, keeping security at places remote from the town. And I'm sure when they begin to hurt them and they are crying, nobody hears them because they are far away from the center of town. And then, you know, they kill them. So this kind of conduct by these kinds of people, contrary to the legal system and away from all social conduct, is becoming very disturbing. And, and I think that the police, the security, must up their game. You don't go roaming and people see you, they say you are keeping, you are, you are trying to catch them. You know, in the night, they are all over. Sometimes the security is present and all that. But at the blind side of them, they go to kill. So there must be some other arrangements that can trap them, especially um, something that is arranged to bait them to go in to kill, and then they can be trapped. I, I see. You know, I have right. seen other people who are right. advertising and saying, I can get people, make mm. people rich. They go to radio stations to advertise. And eventually, when you go, they tell you to bring some other items. And I suspect that some of the items will include human parts and things like that. Or else, we don't understand the kind of rituals going on for people to be killed. This is part of the backwardness of our African people. And, and in fact, the, 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 this concern that you express, not just limited to your constituency, is now the, the sentiments are spreading across the country now because we're hearing some other cases as well. In, in part of the Bono and, and Ahafo regions. So these 16 people, you say, have been killed in your constituency alone, mysteriously. Within which period did these mysterious killings happen? Uh, over the last two years. Yeah, over the last two years. Over the last two years. I see, but has the the hundred thousand? I recall you put a hundred thousand CDs bounty on on these persons, so that it would motivate the people in the community to give out some more information. Has that helped in any way? Yeah, it has. Uh, I've seen lots of young men set up their groups, and and then they say they are looking for the people. I was visited by a voluntary organizations. And they came out with their own plans and uh, were convincing me that some work is going on. They were set up by the WANA. And I was also informed about another voluntary group in the night. They also have places they go and to check out on it. And just this morning, I was in WA before I flew. Um, some two young men came to me and told me what they are also doing. It has energized the people. It has given them some impetus. To, to go in there to look for the murderers. So for me, I think it's a it's a good sign for them to go out and and and, and win the prize. I see. Now, uh, Chris, Noble Rashid Purple mentions twenty of such mysterious killings in the Bole area alone, and and this is in the Savannah region. His constituency is in another region. Now, you know what's happening in the Bola area quite, quite well, is it not? What's the situation there? Yes, so, uh, Alfred, uh, rightly so, as the uh, Honorable Member of Parliament uh, mentioned, uh, the Bola uh, uh, community alone, between 2022 and uh, today, 21 uh, deaths have been recorded. You know, the recent one happened uh, in July where... Uh, a man allegedly was killed and his head chopped off. That's the recent one, the very recent one. And so this brings the number to some 21 uh, deaths recorded. And um, we have run stories in the Bole area. Uh, deployment of security was made by the uh, National Security Ministry uh, together with the police service. 
And uh, when they came in to now, uh, we are yet to hear any arrest. But uh, I must say that uh, the community as well, justice in uh, is done in war, like the MP has mentioned. Um, the community members have also formed watchdog committees uh, to assist the security in carrying out this uh, uh, mission. And so uh, we are only hoping that this brings to an end uh, the uh, murder, murder cases that have been recorded in the area. If not, Alfred, it's a very serious uh, situation there. The youth of the community uh, last month uh, demonstrated uh, against them um, uh, suspected serial killings, right. and it's, it's just like in war where security men are the target. And so you go for night uh, duty as a watchman or night security person, and the next day uh, you are reported dead. And so that has been uh, the situation in the war area. And now it is moving gradually to the Solatuna Kalba district I because see. in the last three months, three deaths have been recorded, with a recent one being what we are talking about, the, the, the young lady, um, even though community members still do not know, cannot tell what really uh, okay. uh, uh, brought about this death, but the uh, majority of the people suspect that what is happening in Wa, what is happening in Bole, is what is right. now shifting into the Sola Tuna Kalba district, and it's serious. Right. It is indeed, and, and that's why we're, we're spending morning. Uh, Chris, appreciate your time. Thank you so much for this update. I know you, you have your tabs on this one. And so uh, whatever the developments will definitely be updating our viewers on this. And Nambu Rashid Purple, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on, on, on Ghana tonight. You, you want to make a quick point before we go quickly? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll call on you all, the journalists, to work very hard to help us to unearth this kind of mystical conduct of these people. Um, we, heard of, we hear about murderers and we hear about serial killing. Never did we know that it can happen within our scope of space and nothing can be done. But I think that even if it is 10 years, I hope and pray that these people will be tracked down, arrested, go, go through the legal system and then punished for what they have done to those individuals who lost their lives and the tension they have created in society. Indeed. Thank you. Uh, Rashid Purple is a member of parliament for the WA Central constituency. Thank you for joining us uh, here on Ghana tonight. And uh, I'm just going to show you exactly how the, the summary of the story looks like and why we should all be concerned. Take a look at this. Based on reports that have been published, this strange, inexplicable, mysterious killings in the northern part of the country, Sola, Savannah region, three killings in a spate of three months. The second killing or, or incident occurred on July 19. The latest, just a few days ago, August 13, at, uh, this is yesterday, as a matter of fact, a tuna involving a hairdresser, apprentice, as I've been telling you. Um, that's for the Savannah, that's the Sola, Savannah region. And then also, let's look at what's happening in, in Bali. 22 persons killed in 2022, between 2022 and now. Now, four persons killed between May and June this year alone under mysterious circumstances. Nobody has been arrested as we speak. The latest killing was on the 8th of July involving a middle-aged man, murdered and, and the head severed. So that's what we're talking about. That's how serious the situation is. And, and the worry is that nobody has been arrested as yet. And, and that's where the concern is. And we'll keep an eye on this one. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, the National Democratic Congress has campaigned promise of no fees stress, it's facing rigorous public scrutiny. And a lot of reactions for that matter. And this is your election command center as we continue the conversations on the manifesto check with Dennis Boberi Dam and the promises being made now by the political parties, which will definitely find its way into their manifestos. The NPP is launching its manifesto on the 18th, the 18th of this month, which is just four days away. And we here on your election command center will be on the ground to bring you everything you need to know. But the University Teachers Association of Ghana has welcomed the flag bearer of the NDC's proposed policy to scrap the academic user fees for level 100 tertiary students in public institutions or public universities or 
tertiary institutions as a country if he wins the general elections. This promise, which has since attracted intense public debate pertaining to funding, accommodation, and other aspects of tertiary education, which many believe should be considered first before the implementation, but furtherance to this promise that was made, John Mahama has been giving some further and better particulars to this, this promise we're talking about. Take a look. You think 2,500 CDs or something is small. For some families to be able to put 2,500 CDs together is a real struggle. And so we don't want, especially in the first year, when the students are coming in for the first time, for them to go through what we call fee stress. And that's why we call it a no fee stress policy. And so we're saying that we can absorb the academic facilitator utility fees, but it will not affect the subventions of governments to the uh, universities and institutions of higher learning. The subvention from government has kept declining. We're going to increase the subvention, but apart from that, we're going to make sure that the university gets their subvention on time so that they can balance their budgets. And we approximate that for all first-year students in public tertiary institutions, it should cost anywhere between 270 to about 290 million Ghana cities. The president, a few years ago, his travel budget for traveling in nine months amounted to 69 million Ghana cities. That's John Mahama there. Let's go on to Zoom now and bring in the national president of the University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG, they are an integral stakeholder in, in this conversation we're talking about and the target of this promise made by John Mahama. And I thank you, Professor Mahmoudou Akudugu. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First off, this, this further detail we're getting from the NDC flag bearer. Now we know it's limited at least for the start for public university entrance. Now the costing question that was asked, he gives a bracket or a range of between 270 million to 290 million on an annual basis. Then also, he talks about the subventions going to be increased to you, the public universities, because there was a question that you also rely on these academic fees for some form of internally generated funds. He says your IGF and these subventions will be increased as well. Is UTAG having any conversations as, as we speak about this promise made so far? Yeah, thank you uh, again for the opportunity. Um, we, we, we believe that all these policies are, are very good intentions. And so um, our position is that we need to have a fuller picture of what is it that each of the parties is planning for tertiary education space. And so if you realized um, yesterday, or is it two days ago, when the news of the um, the fee waiver for all level 100 students came up, uh, we asked for further and better particulars. And at least it's imagined that uh, a number of other things are happening. And uh, they talked about the expansion or increment in the subvention and the rest of it. But beyond that, uh, we would want to have a fuller picture of the whole situation. Uh, what is it that we want to do in the tertiary education space? Um, there are issues of infrastructure. There are issues of um, lateral recruitments and quality issues and the rest of it. And so we see it as a good news. Uh, but then uh, we have to do further analysis and see how can we make it better. The idea is to see how best we can work with whatever propositions they are making uh, to work better. That is all that there is to it that uh, we are looking for. Great. So, so you're looking forward to some form of engagement between UTAG, that's the university teachers, and the, the flag bearers, or in this case, the flag bearer of the NDC, correct? Yes, we, we, we have... We, we have already actually sent invitations to the flag bearers requesting for such a meeting with us. 
uh, to tell us exactly what their plans are for the tertiary education sector and so that we can make our inputs and see how we can together fine tune whatever that they are thinking about to to be able to specifically address the challenges that we face as a sector um we are yet to receive feedback from 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 them but we are hopeful that they will get back to us and uh, they would agree to meet us and then we have these conversations so that together mm -hmm. we can get uh, something that will come out that will be right uh, tlet and be able to make the impact that we're all looking for but but i mean you're you're in there and uh, utag is a very important and influential constituency and a stakeholder in the university space how much of a solution is this offering or the, the problem at stake that this particular proposal is seeking to solve how much of a really a real problem is it um again is is very uh, is very important for us to understand the context. For example, statistics are being provided about students being offered admissions, and they are not taking it up, largely due to financial constraints and all that. Yes, um, we we, ha we have to interrogate the statistics. Um, we, we do, I mean, as they were told that about four to five thousand, but we also reckon that in Ghana. There are, let's say, technical universities, um, traditional universities combined, are about 25 of them. Students are at liberty to apply to uh, 15, any of the 15 traditional universities, any of the 10 technical universities, any of the 46 colleges of education. And so the fact that a student has not picked up an admission at the University for Development Studies, UDS, doesn't mean that that student has not picked up admission at KNUSD where she might have applied. And so it's important to see these statistics that we have, how, what percentage of it were multiple you know, applications and, and what percentage, because otherwise if you just ask KNUSD to tell you how many students did you offer admission and, and they didn't of, they didn't pick it up because of financial constraints. You pick that one and add it to what you get from Legon, add it to what you get from UDS and all that. It's not going to be a true picture of the situation. And so, well, we, we of course, there are students that genuinely are having financial constraints mm -hmm. and cannot pay. But as to how many of them they are, uh, we can't tell at, uh, us at this time. But mm -hmm. even if it is just five students, it's worth giving them support. Right. But that is why we also think that uh, targeting, proper targeting of students who really need support uh, to pick up or to have university education, so rather be the way to go rather than a wholesale uh, uh, implementation of this policy. I thank you very much for your thoughts on this. And this is a conversation that is free-flowing and is evolving after this promise was made a couple of days ago. We'll see how things play out in the main manifesto of the NDC because the NDC has also just communicated that they are going to launch their manifesto on the 28th of this month. So all things being equal, by end of this month, we'll have the manifestos of at least the MPP and the NDC and also the Movement for Change GTP to do some extensive analysis with Professor Mamudu Akudugu. Thank you so much for joining us, President, National President of the University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG. And on that question of targeting and so on, we put all of this in our Young Voters Voices segment. We interacted with some students at the University of Ghana. Take a look. Welcome to the Young Voters Voices segment. And today we are right here on the University of Ghana campus. We'll be speaking to students and getting their reactions on the no academic fee policy. So right by me, we have a student. Hello, can I know your name? Yeah, please, I'm called Sharaf. Uh, I think um, it's a good policy. If you hear it for the first time, as you hear something is free, we are always welcoming something that is free, but how do we think about whether it's sustainable and also the consequences that could come after this? Well, some say that it's an issue of targeting the right people 
to benefit from it. That's people who really cannot afford and not just everyone. Do you agree with that? So if you think someone cannot afford and you are only helping them for the level 100, so what comes after that? Well, I think it's a very good idea, but um, I think it would be much better if um, the policy would be in favor of those who actually need it and not every person who is coming into level 100 because um, there's probably going to be some minister's child who can afford it, but the implementation of this policy in its current form would see them not paying anything. If you take my um, 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 my constituency, for example, Doma West, many people aspire to be in various tertiary institutions, but they are unable to, to enroll in the various tertiary institutions. So I think it's a good policy and, and it's going to help. Implementing this policy, I think is it's going to be a long way for... But, for, for he says that he's going to introduce um, uh, the building of more hostels at a cheaper cost for university students. Don't you think this will mitigate the issue of... I think this has always been the problem. It would be like it's hostels with private investors at a cheaper cost. Fine. Look at those uh, uh, already, the, the current ones, the diaspora halls, they charge at least 5600 for for any room. But people are still not been able to afford it. Unlike the traditional house, that maybe someone can pay 2400 and be there. That one, we can consider it as okay. But these private investors, mind you, they come in and then they want profit. I think it's a very good policy. Um Young voters' voices here on the Your Election Command Centre. There's going to be more of it. You'll find it on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com and the 3news channel as well. And so you can log on there and get a full complement of this. But the next phase of this conversation about this promise or by the NDC is the targeting bit because that's quite prominent as well in the free senior high school policy, targeting the poor. How's that going to be done? That's a question we'll, we'll be asking. But coming up next... Stay with the education sector. CTAC, that's the Colleges of Education Teachers Association of Ghana, remains on strike a couple of months after the failed attempts to resolve their impasse with the government. What can really the resolution be to this matter? That's the question we are asking because as we speak, there are thousands of students at these Colleges of Education who have their fate hanging in the balance, not knowing exactly what to do. Earlier today, CTAC issued a statement. And bear in mind, today, the 14th of August, is exactly two months after CTAC declared this nationwide strike. They declared the strike on the 14th of June. So it's been two months exactly they've been on strike. And they issued a statement today and responding to what they say is a twisting of facts by the education minister and some other persons who have been speaking about this in government, they say, quote, that the only, in their view, thing that government is doing is to frustrate CTAC, to call off its legitimate strike so that the employer can get its peace of mind to sleep over the compulsory arbitration award, which has been pending since 2nd of May 2023. Until government provides concrete evidence, that's what they're asking for, concrete evidence of implementation by way of payment, to their members, the union cannot trust the very government which has misled us in calling of three different strike actions regarding the same monies in the recent past. They want, as you say, an alert in their account, or else the strike, they are not calling it off. CETA cannot embark on another strike over the same matter again. So the government must do the needful to restore the normalcy in the academic space of the 46 public colleges of education. They say enough is enough. That is what they are asking for, essentially. And this is part of the statement that they have uh, been also putting out there and the demands that they have been making uh, so far. Let's stay a bit further on this. Thomas Ampoma is the National Secretary of the Colleges of Education Teachers Association of Ghana, CTAG. He's joining us on the telephone. Mr. Ampoma, good evening to you. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Good evening, Pastor. Thank you for having me. Good night. Thank you very much. Great. Now, you talk about some twisting of facts in this statement you issued earlier 
on the part of government. And in fact, you mentioned the education minister in there. What exactly are you talking about? Yes, when often you read, you read the document, we are saying that it is not factual that CITA has been ordered by any court to call up our strike action. Even in the National Labor Commission on the 20th of June, when they met the CITA and the government team, do not declare the strike as illegal. So the commission ordered that we should take notes or we should take time to call up the strike while the, the state then the state government to court. In fact, we wrote to our lawyers to them to tell them that we are not calling up the strike because last year the same thing happened. And the commission gave directions that we should call up the strike while the government complies with the arbitration award by the end of August, sorry, by the end of October 2023. The government went and said, we went back and we, we went back to teach. The government did not go by the arbitral award or the directive of the National Labor Commission. So what the MSC is saying that we have been ordered to call up our strike. No authority, no power, no MSC, no court has ordered us to call up our strike. The, the MSC is saying that, in fact, he has signed an MOU with us. And the matter is that the MOU was signed with the understanding that CITA will communicate the MOU to its national council for validation or approval before the MOU can be said to be have been approved. Before that, the limited have gone ahead to see our July salary. And other things, the national council rejected the MOU. That's right. And we wrote to the minister to that effect. So we don't know why the minister said he's talking about the MOU that we signed. Yeah. Hello, Ms. Ampoma? Hello? I'm there. Hello? I'm saying for the month of July, you didn't receive your salaries. No, July is not pay us. We have not received July salary as, of, as I'm seeking. Saying that this MOU that you agreed upon with the minister at the last meeting, your members rejected it. Why? We rejected it because the term given in the MOU did not actually meet what members are expecting. There are arrears of 20 months to be paid. There was no roadmap for payment of that arrear. The arbitral award that was given, the way they want to implement it, they have not been given the opportunity right. to see what exactly they are doing. We want to see whether what they are doing is exactly what the NLC asked them to do. They started the exercise three weeks today. Okay. They have never invited us to see whatever they are doing, but they keep on saying that they are still working on the migration, okay. which we don't have any idea about. I see. So that is why we rejected the MOU. Uh, right. But Mr. Mawa, so you've been on strike for the past two months. Today is exactly two months you declared a strike. We understand you have a meeting scheduled for tomorrow with the vice president. Correct? Correct. Perfect. Tomorrow, we are scheduled to have two major meetings. One is at the Ghana Social Education Commission at 10 a.m. in the morning. We are going there to see exactly what we are doing, what we say we are doing as an aggression. Right. We want to go there for them to beat us, for us to see exactly what we are doing, whether it is in line with what the NLC ordered them to do. So there we will be moving to the Jubilee House, to the Vice President, who invited us uh, this evening that we should come to the Jubilee House for an interaction. So the next of CITA will be meeting the Vice President tomorrow at 1 p.m. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll definitely be lurking around these meetings just to get some more information for our viewers. Thank you. That's uh, Thomas Ampoma. He's a National Secretary of the Colleges of Education Teachers Association of Ghana, CITA. To say exactly two months they've been on strike. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, after this quick break, we continue our conversation on the ongoing illegal mining activities at the Konongo area in the Ashanti region. We have been to the site 
after we got information from you, our viewers in the Konongo area, the pictures you sent to us. My colleague Ibrahim Abubakar has been to the area. We have some exclusive videos for you, and it's quite troubling to say the least. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. Now, residents of Konongo are getting alarmed and worried increasingly over the growing activities of illegal mining in the area, especially along the main Konongo Accra Highway. Now, the videos you are seeing are videos we captured this, this afternoon. After you, our viewers, sent us pictures of what's happening in that area yesterday on Ghana Tonight. Well, Ibrahim Abubakar is joining us on, on Zoom. He's my colleague. He visited this area and brought us these videos. Ibrahim, this is shocking, to say the least, because this is not like uh, the deepest part of the forest. We understand it's, it's quite close to the main Accra Konongo Highway, is it not? Exactly, Alfred. Um, a very, very disturbing situation. So even before, because of the proximity of the illegal mining activity uh, and the road sign, um, any motorist or passer, passerby, it easily catches your attention because this is an activity that they are doing just a few meters to the main Konongo Accra Road. And um, honestly, I'll be surprised to hear that, um, to hear that any lo local authority or anyone who uses that stretch is unaware of this activity. So it is something that they are aware. In fact, this morning when we got to the scene, uh, we tried to speak to the MC who is the head of DISEC in the area because this is a security situation. Uh, he, he said he's aware of the situation but has some explanation to that. But then he's busy and he'll get back to us maybe later on Friday. But this is an activity where the uh, Environmental Protection Agency in Konongo and the Minerals Commission say they are unaware. Unaware not because they've not seen the activity taking place, but they are saying that no individual or company has been issued a mining license at that stretch. In fact, the EPA told us that um, just some few weeks ago, the Assembly wrote a letter to them that um, they will be undertaking some dredging um, exercise there just so they will prevent flooding in that area. Because we have the Oweri River passing through where the illegal activity is currently ongoing. And this is um, a water source that serves the entire Congo and even beyond. So now that they are heavily polluting that water, it is not only a concern to residents alone, but also Ghana Water Company Limited, because it means that the uh, cost of treating water will have to triple or even quadruple before they get the water that they can serve they are consuming. So it's a worrying development and residents are getting angry. There is a church which is very close to where the mining activity is ongoing. In fact, the pastor said on a number of occasions, he has reported the matter to the assembly, yet they pretend as if they are unaware of the situation. And in fact, people are boiling with rage to the extent that they are saying if the local authorities or the duty bearers look on and do not do anything to tackle this situation, then they will be forced to also go in fully and attack these miners because one, they are destroying their source of livelihood and also whatever they are doing there poses a health risk to the residents there. And even others were even questioning whether uh, the fight against Galamse, we know government wage war against Galamse, and they are saying that um, they don't believe in that fight. They see that to just be a lip service because whilst government is touting itself to be fighting Galamse, this is an illegality that is gaining grounds in the Konongo enclave. And this is not only the illegal mining site, it keeps expanding and expanding within the Konongo. And 
they are just waiting that um, now that the attention of the authority has been drawn to it, uh, something be done about it. That's a shocking, to say the least. I, I, I thank you, Ibrahim, for this comprehensive detail you give to us. And we're going to stay on this as well because tomorrow we, we have some exclusive detail as well from you. So we are not leaving this matter. Because looking at the, the level of pollution of the water, we just showed briefly, and I counted about four excavators on, on that site alone. And so thank you for this detail, Ibrahim. We will look at that. Dennis, look at this. How many excavators do you count there? About five One, two, three, four, not? five. Yeah, more than that. In a way. We, we cannot be winning the fight against illegal mining with this. Certainly not. Certainly not. Anyway, let's go to manifesto check now, shall we? Right away. So we still stay on what we started off with the week. The youth resource centers across the country, the 10 of them in all, to be constructed in some 10 regions. We've shown you the one in the Upper East region before. We did the same for the one in the Greater Accra region. And today we are going straight to the Volta region, where one was supposed to be constructed in who. We mm -hmm. begin this by showing you what government's own assessment of this project has been on their performance tracker. So in the performance tracker, when you see, you see that the project has been pegged at 94% um, completed. That's their own assessment of the project. 94%. 94%. With this? 6% shy completion and commissioning and put, uh, putting it to use. Wow. So this is what it is. Unfortunately, it has also suffered the fate of very much like the rest that we've seen so far. So let's, 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 let's have a look at the current state of that particular project and what has become of it even though you see it nicely on the screen here. Let's see what exactly is on the ground. Uh -huh. And this video is Ketsi Happy Spots. So that's, that's the project so you see right there. This one says what, 95% complete? 94, 94 on the tracker. This on the tracker? Yes. And on the status, they indicated that this project started in 2018, and it is 2020, so... But the, the brownish patch there, is it supposed to be the Titan tracks? Yes. And this is part of the 94% completion? Complete. But in all fairness, work has progressed. The last yeah, time we worked on the ground... this is better than the others that we've seen yes, in the last two days. But the problem has been, why leave it in these states? And it's been like this for... Because when you look at their own indication, project target was what? 2018, 2020. We're in 2024, and this is what you have there. It's rotting away, just like the others. And this is found in the Volta region. This is whole. This is the whole one. And uh, this is not the bush. It's supposed to be a, a it's football field. It's supposed to be field. the football field, the resource center for the youth. I see all the so, floodlights there and so on. And in the coming days, we'll seek answers, really, to what is this. Because usually the problem we have is government abandoning projects of previous governments. Yeah. But this is, I mean, these are projects that have been started by the same government and they do not seem to want to complete them and hand them over. For whatever reason, we so are yet to be officially to be told. Abandoned site. Of course, um, I mean, and like I showed you what the uh, sports minister said, they have not, it's, it's funding issues. And they have issues with the contractors. But before we go, the mm. one in the upper west region in Wa seemed to be progressing steadily. I, we gather that work is still ongoing, but for some reason, some of these things they don't allow media in. For what I mean, reason? We are supposed to tell the Is story. Is it a national security site? They virtually declare them as national, I mean, national security site. So you need all the permits. Let's let's look at what is ongoing in what. At least we've been able to get some few um, visuals as to the current state of that particular project. We understand the contractor is still on site at that place, I see. and the work is progressing steadily. And this is the war one. Let, no, this not this not the war one. The war one we have. The videos of that yes yeah, okay, so, so this is this it. is the entrance looks very beautiful from outside indeed. Yeah. indeed so in there this is the work that is ongoing so even though even though all these are behind the scheduled dates we're just hoping that this one too will not suffer the fate of the rest that have been left to virtually rot away because we spent so much money in putting these things up hopefully it doesn't on the average two million dollars yeah that's a lot of money i mean hope has never been the basis for public policy formulation but in our part <laughs> of the world we just have to hope you know that things things don't get this way i mean look if these centers and want to say thank them. you that would I mean, have been huge investment absolutely. for the youth and the youth would have been glad to 
make good use of these things. True. The verdict as always is with the people. It's indeed with the people. People. Yeah. It's indeed people. Thank you, Dennis Pobey, with them, uh, as always, for doing this for God and country. If these youth centers were as beautiful as the way you are dressed, <laughs> you know, I don't think we'll even have a story. Alfred, they tell. really are, except they haven't been handed over. Uh, anyway. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you so much. That's Manifesto Check with Dennis Bobby Wadam. There's more of it on 3news.com. That's why you need to make some time and visit 3news.com and also TV3 Ghana on Facebook and get all the details. On behalf of the rest of the team, thank you for staying with us here on Ghana tonight. I'm Alfred Akansi. Have a good night. Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint, superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage, simply superior.